Welcome to the Cyberpunk 2077 Law Ultimate Preview, covering all the key law topics leading up to the events of 2077. That will give you the edge in Night City. After all, knowledge is power. Your journey in Night City begins by creating your V, where you can choose between a nomad, street kid and corporate life path. The genesis of these life paths began with the destruction of the American family. Many states were home to large numbers of non-productive citizens at the beginning of the collapse. The welfare system quickly reached a state of attrition. States that instituted stringent controls in the beginning, like California, Texas, Utah and Nevada, were much more prepared to deal with an extended crisis. But many states simply tried to bury their heads in the sand. Many felt the crisis would end quickly. It did not. Although many of the states soon instituted systems similar to the standard Northern California citizen identification process by 1998, it was far too late. By the year 2000, over 150 million were disenfranchised. Circa 75% of these died. The greatest betrayal of the collapse was the destruction of the family unit, the basis for all forms of civilization since Homo sapiens first walked erect. By the 1980s, the family unit had already fragmented and then shattered, to be replaced in part by the neo-tribal, booster and meta-family structures. These units were a suitable replacement for a family after the base socialization skills were in place. But in the early childhood stages of development, the lack of a cohesive and demonstrative family structure only crippled the youth of post-collapse America. So, what is happening to the children, and how does this impact upon V? Three distinct structures exist that emulate these potential life path. The neo-tribals, representing the nomad families, the street kids, dealing with the entirety of the street punk scene, and lastly, the mixed nuclear and meta-families that cover much of the corporate world. In the last 60 years, the number of Americans in a nuclear or classic two-parent family had gone from 80% to 2%. During the collapse, the population of America was decreased by about 100 million. One in three of these deaths was a parent. Almost half of the families were sole parent families. With the other socioeconomic factors in sync, this effectively orphaned some 30 million children in the space of 18 months. 10 million of these children were completely unable to support themselves in any way. They simply died or were killed in the collapse. Another 10 million were killed trying to survive under martial law. This left 10 million people loose in society without even the socialization skills of an adolescent. The violence of the martial law period added another 10 million to this figure. By 2020, fully 11% of the population of America had grown up with no real family structure. This segment of the population also reproduced at twice the rate of other Americans. The question remains. With a huge section of the population having neither a frame of reference for parenting or any parenting skills, who raises the next generation? Street Kid. They say if you want to understand the streets, you got to live them. Gangs, fixers, small time pushers, you were raised by them all. Down here, the law of a jungle dictates the weak serve the strong. The only law in Night City you have yet to break. Street children make up most of the youth in cyberpunk America. This is thanks to minimum supervision due to the increasing workloads and the lack of any public schooling system in most states. By age six, most street kids are unsupervised for up to six hours a day. By age 12, this figure rises to 16 hours a day. By the age of 10, almost 90% of street kids are involved in some type of youth gang, either simplistic and feral child families, or possibly a block gang, or as a junior affiliate to a larger booster gang. 
Whatever the motives, the street killers were on their way to death in their teenage years. Most gangs are simplistic at the early age levels. These feral families are a common sight in post-collapse America, groups of children living in a morass of garbage. Block gangs are an entrenched part of gang culture. Being that these alliances are tied to a neighborhood or building, children are naturally included in the structure. These types of gangs are arguably most similar to their nomad cousins. All facets of life are shared and supported. These are the spiritual descendants of the welfare families of the pre-collapse. Some look after the children while others get jobs. Some watch for intruders while others sleep. Some can teach the basics of literacy. These block gangs still have some semblance of human dignity and shy away from blatantly illegal activity. They cannot risk the chance of police retribution. Without the money to protect themselves, the street kids are abused by most police. Last are the affiliates, large and powerful booster gangs, always looking for replacements and new members. Many allow very young sets to form. Jobs are farmed out as favours to loyal affiliates. Tribute in the form of cash and drugs is paid to the patron. There is a slightly adversarial relationship between the affiliates and the block gangs. As the kids get older, the affiliates are giving higher and higher profile crimes to commit. The local block gangs don't appreciate this attention. Both sides are always wary of the other going to the police. In an easy compromise, punctuated by violence from both sides, usually wins out. By age 14, the affiliates are usually either full members or dead. It is not uncommon for a patron to give an execution over to a group of 12-year-old kids. Even in the cyberpunk era, a murder conviction is difficult to obtain with a juvenile. The most logical explanation of this is the generational gap. Most judges grew up in the more liberal times before the collapse, and there is still a prejudice against executing children. Usually, if any vague pretense of self-defense can be alleged, the kid will get off with a few years. Nomads. Roaming the badlands, looting scrapyards, raiding fuel depots. Life on the road wasn't easy. But growing up in a nomad clan has its perks. Honest, integrity, and a love of freedom. Qualities that few in Night City possess, and no amount of money can buy. Called neo-tribalism by the scholars who study it, there is honor in the nomad system, even if it's only internal. It's not an easy life, but it is fair, at least when dealing with other nomads. These children have the most opportunity for creative play. They are exposed to the greatest selection of role models. They are taught value systems and cultural identity. They are also taught respect and discipline. Contrary to the corporate system, these things are not taught in an artificial setting, and they are not forced. Young nomads are also taught reading and writing, math, mechanics, and electronics. All the skills necessary to survive in the cyberpunk age. The internal respect that is so prevalent in nomad culture is a crucial factor in its success. The nomad policy of acceptance has led an interesting group to its doors. The families have a very high percentage of teachers, not just literate people trying to teach, but real, academic teachers. In the wake of the collapse, many of the revolutionary leaders were teachers. When the military finally regained some control, the first thing they did was round up the radicals. Many of these people were smart enough to leave before the military arrived. When they fled, they joined the nomads. Teachers are not the only people who have fled to the sanctuary. Artists, lawyers, bankers, economists, ex-intelligence operatives, criminals, rockers, priests, simply a huge number of very educated and experienced people, and large numbers of farmers and craftsmen, giving nomad groups the ability to survive. Corporate. Few leave the corporate world with their lives, few are still with their souls intact. You've been there, you've bent the rules, exploited secrets and weaponized information. There's no such thing as a fair game, only winners and losers. 
corporate children are divided into the meta family at the technician clerical level and a return to upper middle class child rearing methods, similar to the indulgent style of the baby boomers of the last century at the management executive level. A child who is taught in the corporate meta family is supervised and disciplined in corporate daycare and preschools. Visitation with parents is limited to holidays and family emergencies. It is necessary for corporate personnel to be able to work unsupervised. In the cyberpunk era, hesitation is death. Delegation and accountability are the rule of the day. Students are taught most facets of the business, but proprietary information is withheld. At age 15, the student is given a final examination. This examination will determine where the student will begin their career within the corporation. Somewhat reminiscent of the GOAT, Generalized Occupational Aptitude Test. The system does not prepare the students for radical change outside of a direct working situation. In the middle and upper corporate levels, child rearing has again become much more personalized. Having worked their way through the hard times, these corporate parents that can afford to raise their children at home with the help of au pairs, servants and a new group of exclusive care centers utilizing European methods. A child growing up in this environment will have a strong sense of elitism matched only by the most exclusive of their peers. This is fostered by upper management in order to refine and strengthen the inherent class structure of the corporation. Among the parents, there is a constant current of vicarious competition, as the triumphs of their children allow them to score social points against other corporate parents. Such success is supportive of the prevailing notion that these offspring will be rightful inheritors of their mother's and father's company positions. Morgan Blackhand, rated as the number one solo professional in the business by the Solar of Fortune Annual 2020 Awards. He was widely considered to be one of the most dangerous individuals in the world of Cyberpunk 2077. So, who is this mysterious solo of fortune? A war-worn veteran of the Second Central American Conflict, Morgan Blackhand, sometimes known as The Hammer, first became a solo by accident, not design. Returning home in 2008 to the ruins of his native Brooklyn, he found himself protecting his next-door neighbor from an abusive and violent ex-husband. The incident ended with Morgan killing the homicidal maniac and earning a local rep on the streets as a protector of the weak. Morgan's good guy image lasted until a dust-down with a marauding booster gang leader, which brought him to the attention of a Militech recruiter. Morgan dealt with the booster with relative ease, and thus was made an offer to join Militech. To Morgan's pragmatic mind, working as a corporate solo wasn't much different from being in the army. The guys upstairs hauled you where to go and who to protect or shoot. By 2013, Blackhand was known throughout the Brotherhood of Solos as a professional equal to the best Europe could offer. In time, Blackhand graduated from being a bodyguard and performing extraction work to tactical operations and strategic threat management. Although his abilities in these areas were exceptional, his reputation as a hard-nosed, no-nonsense boss willing to do what is necessary and join his ops in the field earned him an even wider reputation. Still, the solo's solo, with no hint of stopping now, Morgan is regarded as the number one in the business. The entire profession was improved by the release of the Enforcer's Handbook, with over one million copies audited to date. It is obvious, though, Morgan may have taught many professionals all they know. It is not all that the master knows. Morgan's handling of incidents like the attempted kidnapping of former samurai band member Kerry Uridine, show the touch of a true master. It is interesting to note that all five of the kidnappers were captured by Morgan and turned over to the federal authorities. They were bruised, battered and beaten, but alive. 
Any solo can kill, but only a master like Blackhand can eliminate a threat and embarrass the group's sponsors. Morgan is honest to a fault and never ever harms women and children, but he will make an exception for female solos. He is described as huge, suave with greying hair and pale cynical blue eyes. His voice is whispery, gravelly, rasp, menacing but sometimes friendly. His trademark look is all black, slacks, turtleneck, or a three-piece tactical suit, including his trademark armoured trench coat. During the Fourth Corporate War between Arasaka and Militech, despite having many covert operatives in-house and Lazarus Group options, Militech came to the conclusion that their ties to the US government were so tight that the rest of the world might see Militech as a deniable extension of US policy. Militech therefore put together a covert operations team which would have a certain deniability of its own. They therefore coaxed Morgan Blackhand into the fray, who costs about the equivalent to three normal covert teams put together. During this war, Morgan was described as the most famous living soldier of the 21st century, having completed hundreds of ops with flying colours. He got enough funding out of Militech to subcontract a group of highly skilled and motivated freelancers, making them answerable to him only. Blackhand's covert ops technique is to delegate duties to mission-compatible pairs. These mini-teams each complete their part of a mission individually, with communications depending on code words and burst transmissions. Blackhand works independently, joining many teams where he's needed most. Perhaps the most notable individual in Blackhand's Strike Omega team include Mike Eminem McRae, a medtech who was the field medic who amputated the shattered stump of Blackhand's right arm back in 2009. He went on to medical studies when he returned to the States, but Blackhand never forgot him. When Militech needed a good combat medic who could hold his own in a covert situation, Blackhand tapped Eminem for the job. Militech also benefited from Morgan's network of connections as alongside Alt Cunningham, they were able to convince Rash Botmos not to attack Militech and to assist them in finding Soul Killer. Blackhand's main rival was Adam Smasher, the combat cyborg. Adam saw Morgan as a threat to his metal as better than meat philosophy. Adam repeatedly tried to challenge him to a face-off, but Morgan simply ignored him. Naturally, this snubbing stoked the cyborg's psychopathic rage further. The two finally met during the final moments of the Fourth Corporate War. After successfully planting the nuclear demolition charge in Yarasaka Tower of Night City, Blackhand's Omega team began evacuating from the Arasaka Tower rooftop, only for Adam Smasher to confront him. While the building began to shake from the detonation of a nuclear demolition charge, the two launched themselves at each other in a last desperate attempt to kill their nemesis. The outcome of the duel was for many years unknown. In 2045, rumours began to spread the legendary Solo had been spotted in various First Wave Cities. Militech. In 1998, although still murdered in bankruptcy, the United States government decided that it was time to purchase a new small arms weapon system to replace the aging and obsolete M1680s that its troops were using. Some firing trials were held at the Marine Corps base in Paris Island, South Carolina. Among the officials present was USMC General Donald Lundy, Marine Corps Chief of Staff, who at 50 was one of the youngest officers ever to serve on the Joint Chiefs. In the end, the final trials came down to three weapon systems. One was FN's SAP, a cheap but clunky and unreliable rifle that had made it to the finals only because it permitted the US to stay compatible in ammunition and parts with other troops in the now obsolete NATO alliance. And because Fabrique International seemed to have gained powerful friends in the US government. The second was Colt's new AR-17X, 
a good gun that was destined to lose out in the end due to its high cost. The final entrant was an underdog, that no one had even expected to make the final trials. A compact, reliable and moderately priced rifle designed by expatriate Italian weapons expert Antonio Lucessi and manufactured by a small but successful New Hampshire based firm, Armatec Lucessi International. To General Lundy, the choice was obvious. The Armatec Lucessi system was the best combination of price, reliability, sturdiness, and accuracy. It wasn't a perfect rifle, but it was a damn good one. The best of the three in the trials. Unfortunately, the collapse of the US economy and near collapse of the government had not only tightened the national purse strings, but it had also permitted the fingers of industry influence to penetrate to unsuspected depths within the political infrastructure. The net result was that, despite Donald Lundy's vociferous protests, and to his horror, the contract went to FN. Ironically, five years later, the European community switched to the brand new FN RAL, an excellent gun that was unfortunately largely incompatible with the SAP system. One year later, to the United States government's further embarrassment, American boys armed with unreliable SCP rifles were dying by the thousands in the jungles of tropical South and Central America. Donald Lundy was sorry to see the whole fiasco come to a head, but he observed from a distance. Shortly after the finalization of the contract, he resigned from the Marine Corps to accept the offer of a CEO position at Armatec Lucessi, the company that had so impressed him. Together, Lundy and Lucessi began laying the groundwork that would enable the small Armatec to become the world's largest weapons manufacturing conglomerate. As a former Pentagon chief, Lundy was extremely well connected into the military industrial complex, and he had many extremely wealthy industrialist and venture capitalist contacts. Several of the old guard 20th century military contracting corporations had become bureaucratic, top-heavy and slow-witted, and had suffered crippling blows during the crash. Those that were still selling products were moving lots of shoddy and overpriced merchandise on the strength of contractual inertia alone. The time was ripe in the hostile, post-crash world for a new kind of military manufacturer. Streamlined, efficient, producing superior, modern products at competitive prices, able to deal its technology anywhere in the world, irrespective of political convention or outmoded national alliances. Lundy's pitch, supported by Lucessi's obvious brilliance as a weapons design engineer, was successful, and an infusion of capital was followed by a period of shrewd acquisition and the securing of several key contracts around the world. Armatec was propelled into a period of tremendous expansion, with the company's new world prominence and high visibility came a new name. Armatec Lucessi was retired, and Militec Arms International was born. Militech's growth was rapid, but it did not happen overnight. The first major success came in 2004, when, after the debacle of the Central American Wars, the US finally junked the SAP. New trials were conducted, and the weapon finally chosen was Militech's Ronin Light Assault Rifle. Shortly after that, Militech also won the military sidearm contract. The US's choice of those weapons caused them to sell in huge numbers to other nations and corporations around the world. At the same time, Militech was developing and testing new heavy weapons, including military armored vehicles and aircraft. Moderate prices and well-designed products enabled Militech to break precedent and win several key contracts away from established defense manufacturers that were still operating after the world and US crashes. More US sales led to more international sales, and by the mid-teen years, Militech was the largest defense contractor to the United States and several other countries and corporations as well. 
That made it possible for Militech to buy out several of its failing competitors and incorporate their designers and resources. The rise to the top has not been without its rough spots. Several companies Militech bought out did not want to come quietly, and a few of the takeovers were made 21st century style, with savage corporate wars. In addition, Militech has made enemies of many of the surviving international military manufacturing corporations. Competition has always been fierce among these companies in the warfare-ridden cyberpunk world, and new weapon systems are often proven to prospective buyers when the selling company uses them to destroy its competitors. Now, Militech continues to be a dominating force in military hardware manufacturing. Under the leadership of the capable General Donald Lundy, and the technically brilliant Antonio Lucesi, who not only still designs, but supervises the recruitment and progress of a new generation of talented young designers and engineers. Militech continues to flourish and grow. Among its thousands of products, Militech manufactures small arms, heavy weapons, special weapons and explosives, chemical and biological weapons, aircraft, boats and ships, military computers and avionics, field hardware, military accessories and military cybernetics. A variety of civilian products are also in their catalogue, including security systems, personal lethal and non-lethal weapons and body armour. In addition, Militech has expanded into the lucrative world of mercenary contracting, and the corporation maintains a large force of crack, well-equipped soldiers, for defence and contracting purposes. A policy of ruthless competition and no-quarters corporate warfare has helped keep Militech at the forefront of its industry. Huge, diverse and savage. It is truly a corporation for the 21st century. Unfortunately, Lundy, like so many before him, has been certainly warped by the tremendous power he has acquired. He originally joined Armitech Lucessi with the highest of ideals. He wanted to produce superior military products at reasonable prices so that US and other troops wouldn't be left facing the consequences of inferior weapons workmanship. The expansion of Armitech into Militech was a logical step toward making that philosophy apply to all levels of weapons crafting and not just to small arms. While Militech continues to maintain high quality standards and reasonable prices, there are no longer any idealistic explanations for it. It is strictly business, another way for Militech to expand its market share and consolidate power. Lundy espouses noble corporate goals for public relations reasons, but beneath it all, his desire is to see Militech become the most potent force on the planet. Still, there are some problems for Lundy. While no one within the corporation can deny Lundy's leadership or executive abilities, not everyone on the board of directors likes him. This worries Lundy. Although he holds a large chunk of Militech stock and sits on the board of directors, he is not chairman, and neither is the chairman a pawn of his. This means that he can lose his position as CEO should the board of directors find fault with him. Lundy has been waging a subtle financial war, trying to consolidate as much of the voting power as possible and those of those board members loyal to him. This has caused tension within the board of directors and has led to several assassinations and resignations. At this point, as the power struggle between Lundy and those board members who would replace him with their candidate continues, there is a great deal of turmoil. Lundy is not yet in imminent danger of being forced out, but that time could come if he's not careful. Antonio Lucesi left the Beretta company to emigrate to the United States in 1992. For a few years, he lent his expertise to Colt Firearms. Then, in 1996, he struck out on his own to found Armatech Lucesi. Within two years, the young company had a small but successful line of products on the market. Lucesi knew that to turn enough profit for expansion, he would have to win some large contracts, with the government, 
or with police departments. In 1998, Armatech entered the trials for the new US infantry assault weapon. Unfortunately, due to pork barrel politics, the poorly designed FN system won the contract. On the other hand, several police departments did buy the Armatech gun. Lucessi knew that Armatech was going to have to bring a Washington insider into the company if he was ever going to win a big military contract. In 2000, Lucessi forfeited his position as CEO and chairman of Armatech and wooed Donald Lundy into replacing him. It was a good move on Lucessi's part. 20 years later, Armatech, under its new name, had grown into a monster beyond Lucessi's conception. Lucessi holds a normally high-powered executive vice president spot within Militech, but he has little real power. This does not trouble him since he is truly happy only when working in his design studio or the manufacturing shops. The real measure of Lucessi's influence in Militech is that he is director of the Small Arms Development Division and is responsible for overseeing systems development and production and for recruiting new engineering and design talent. In this environment, Lucessi is content and happy with freedom and resources beyond any he ever thought he would have. He continues to produce innovative, award-winning weapons for his company. Despite the medical advantages of the era, Lucessi has suffered problems with age. His eyes have long since failed and have been replaced with cyberware. His arthritic hands have also given way to new artificial ones. Lucessi is a product of the previous age and doesn't like having all this metal and plastic in his body, but he knows that it's the only way to continue his work. Since his abilities seem to have increased with age, no one in the board of directors is in any hurry to push him out. Because of his talent and knowledge of Militech proprietary data, Lucessi represents a high extraction risk. As a protective measure, he lives and works with his staff at the headquarters tower. He doesn't enjoy it and would rather work at the old Armatech shops in New Hampshire, where many of the Militech small arms design facilities are now located. Dr. Engelson is a Vice President, Director of the Militech Special Projects Department and one of the most important non-board members in the Militech hierarchy. Dr. Engelson's specialities are biomechanics, biochemistry and reconstructive surgery. Besides being General Director of Special Projects, he is also running the genetic, cybernetic and chemical modification experiments being performed by the department. He is known amongst the troops and lower executives as Dr. Death and considered someone to avoid. It is rumoured that to cross him is to end up as the subject in one of his experiments. You might end up dead or worse. Anastasia Lucessi, granddaughter of Antonio Lucessi, who secured her a space in the Militech Special Operations Training School. Rather than moving on into the business side of things, Anastasia took to the combat training and, much to her grandfather's consternation, decided to make a career out of special operations. Anastasia would become one of Militech's most dangerous agents. She is seductively beautiful, merciless and adept at several forms of combat. She has run infiltration, extraction, espionage and assassination missions. She is known by the codename Sphinx, although many troops call her the equivalent of a female dog. During the Shadow War and Fourth Corporate War, she was placed under the command of freelancer Morgan Blackhand. Though not officially part of Morgan's team, Anastasia worked closely with him to absorb his techniques and tactics. She was also given another mission. To eliminate Blackhand, if he threatened Militech. In order to fulfill her assignment, she decided to try and seduce Morgan. Whether that worked or not remains unknown. 
Alt Cunningham was a super wizard class netrunner and the creator of the Black Ice program, Soul Killer. In 2013, while working for ITS, Alt initially envisioned Soul Killer as a way of electronically preserving the intellects of dying people. Soul Killer started as a storage matrix to contain artificial personalities, but Alt managed to evolve it to contain living engrams. In other words, a person's ghost. Alt discovered that she could transfer the ghost from a computer to a physical body and back again. A version of immortality. It had one drawback though. It was a stationary program, locked to a specific system architecture. ITS wanted to weaponize it, thus she stopped her research. This is when Arasaka would become interested in acquiring Soul Killer. Soul Killer 1 was an anti-netrunner program that uses an advanced matrix recorder to copy the entire personality of an intruder, storing it in a huge database. It then wipes the original personality away, leaving a mindless husk that eventually dies. Arasaka wanted to develop Soul Kill as a weapon and so kidnapped Alt to force her to finish their version. During the Arasaka Tower riot on April 13th, 2013, Johnny Silverhand would attempt to rescue Alt, while Arasaka used Soul Killer on her. However, Alt had created a backdoor in the program, giving her full control once her ghost had been transferred. She quickly used her new abilities to eliminate all the Arasaka guards and transfer $20 million from Arasaka into a sub-account under her name. Alt then hacked into the tower's security system and had Toshiro, the individual in charge of Arasaka research operations, at her mercy. Before she could transfer her ghost back, Silverhand and friends would intervene. In the commotion, Alt's cyberdeck was disconnected, breaking her audio connections. Johnny Silverhand, upon seeing Alt's lifeless body, executed Toshiro, unaware that Alt was still alive. Silverhand disconnected Alt's still warm body from the net running gear and carried her away, while Alt's ghost screamed out of the mainframe monitors, but no one could hear her. Silverhand would subsequently record Never Fade Away. Despite the setback, K. Arasaka never stopped dreaming of having a mobile killer that could roam the net lobotomizing enemies, thus using fragments of code that remain from the original in Alt's notes. By late 2020, Soul Killer 2 was developed. Until the Shadow War started, Militech was able to eliminate many of Arasaka's best netrunners. They also acquired the services of Rash Botmos and Alt Cunningham. Arasaka was retaliated by unleashing Soul Killer 2 which instantly turned the tide of a war. Many of Militech's netrunners were killed within days. Knowing what was at stake, Rash managed to track down and destroy one of Soul Killer's base of operations, but in doing so, he accidentally gave away his position, allowing Arasaka to capture Alt and assassinate Rash. With Alt's assistance, Arasaka gave birth to Soul Killer 3, almost an AI in its own right, and given it displayed cunning and intellect. Version 3 was completely mobile and could adapt itself to attack multiple targets simultaneously. When Militech attacked Arasaka Tower in Night City, information was leaked to Silverhand that Alt was being held captive, and thus he aimed to save her. Johnny and his team were not aware that they were being used as decoys to give Morgan Blackhand's team the opportunity to nuke the towers. During the mission, Silverhand sacrificed himself to buy Spider Murphy just enough time to download Alt back onto the net. Soul Killer was not destroyed when the nuclear demolition charge was detonated. Ergo, Spider would use the Soul Killer on K. Arasaka, then destroy what she assumed to be the last Soul Killer system. As for Alt Cunningham, during the time of the Red, she became the leader of the ghosts, which were the disembodied victims of Soul Killer. They found a new home. Ghost World, or as some call it, Shangri-La, in the ruins of bio-destroyed Hong Kong. Arisaka, born in 1919 to an enterprising industrialist, Sabro Arisaka served in the Imperial Air Force during World War II until his crippling injury in 1942 dropped him out of a war. In 1960, he stepped into his father's shoes as head of the Arisaka Corporation. Realizing that information equals power, Sabro formed the Arasaka Security Division, whose services came into demand as the world plunged into total anarchy. Forty years of study and careful theorization had allowed 
Sabro to predict the crash and the collapse long before they happened. So Arasaka weathered the storm. At the time of 2020, Sabro was one of the wealthiest men in the world and 101 years old. He had a great deal of body reconstruction and his destroyed arm and eye were replaced by cyberware. Nonetheless, he was confined to a wheelchair and rarely left the impregnable family compound outside of Tokyo. Despite his physical limitations, his mind remained sharp. Although his son Kei was now the nominal head of the Arasaka Corporation, all major decisions and policies were still subject to Saburo's discretion. Saburo groomed his son Kei for eventual complete control and the realization of his private goals, but during the time of Cyberpunk 2020, he remained undeniably in charge. Heir apparent to the Arasaka Empire, Kei is Saburo's eldest son and most trusted confidant. His expertise in matters of business, finance and investment is second only to his father's. Although Saburo still makes the most critical decisions, Kei, at age 40, was already official CEO of the corporation and has many years of executive experience under his belt. Kei is fully aware of his father's methods and the scope of the corporation's power. He shares in Sabro's nationalistic dreams and has every intention of following them through after his beloved father dies. Many considered Kei more dangerous than Sabro because he's not driven by hate. While Sabro's emotions would often get the better of him, Kei is cold and calculating. He thought nothing of employing violence and torture to close a deal or solve a problem. Whereas Sabro's spirits rise and fall with the fortunes of his brainchild, Kei maintains a detachment he considers imperative to objective decision making. The only time Kei demonstrates any emotion is around his family and most trusted friends. Kay was devoted to his father and younger half-sister, and always did his best to ensure their happiness and comfort. While Sabro is a virtual prisoner of the compound, Kay travelled the world in near orbit ceaselessly, arranging meetings, consolidating business, and making contacts. He would be instrumental in leading Arasaka's forces during the Fourth Corporate War. Following the fall of the Arasaka Towers, Kei attempted to escape from Night City. The Sea Viper's engines are off. Very strange, he thinks. I gave no orders to stop. Have they arrived at the submarine rendezvous so soon? Takashi, Niroko. No answer. He slides his hand into the secret panel in the bulkhead above and withdraws his pistol and wakizashi. As he opens the door, Kay notices his guards slumped in the alcove. He checks their pulses, alive but unconscious. No sign of a struggle, a smell of ozone, a taser or EMP pulse, he thought to himself. Kay made his way through the skip, checking for someone, anyone, or some cause for the intrusion. Even Taisa Ogawa is down, covered in some form of plastic, his electronic systems garbled. Everyone else is missing or slumped over at their station. There isn't even a sign of a fight. He comes to the forecastle, stops. There are lights in the special room used for the tea ceremony. He draws his pistol from his sash. The doors slide open. Inside, the soft lights cast an amber flow over a low table, on which are set a massive handgun some kind of computer gear, and a dozen caseless rounds. On the far side is a young, pretty woman kneeling down, dressed in a kimono. Her face seems unaccustomed to the grim look on it. He flips through his memories and makes an association. His pistol comes up. Spider Murphy. An unexpected pleasure. You are, however, uninvited. I invited myself. Your guards didn't seem to mind. I do. And I believe I have the power to enforce my will. He waved his gun. You need bullets to use that, if I remember correctly. 
but I could be wrong. After all, I'm just a data thief. Her lips form a smirk. Kay, shocked, stares in disbelief at the rounds on the table. Dumbfounded, he pops the magazine of his handgun to find it empty. He draws his wakizashi. Spider is non-pulsed. Mine, of course, is loaded. Your people are fine, some will need medical attention. It's amazing what you can do with less than lethal technology these days, and a few talented friends. Kay sees two figures step out from behind a painted screen, an alpha Borg he does not recognise, the other a woman whose demeanour says solo. While they do not brandish their weapons, their presence ends his plan to rush the girl. So, now what? Now, Spider says as she picks a bottle from beside her, you are going to share some sake with me, and then I'm going to plug you into this little box. When I do, a soul killer system will wipe your mind and place it in a prison Rash Botmar set up a long time ago. It was intended for your father, but I don't think Rash would disapprove of your occupancy. I see. And if I choose not to? You have no choice. You've lost everything your father built. Your nation has turned its back on you. You have dishonoured yourself and your family. It has all turned to ash. You must make amends. Spider pours the sake with his steady hand. She passes a cup over to Kay, who takes it with a steady hand. They drink. He nods to the computer link and the cable that is cold next to it. You would have me execute myself. I could force you, but I have no wish to. It is inevitable. It is the only honourable thing for you to do. Think of it as seppuku. You are samurai, are you not? Her words are earned blades slicing away the shield he had built in his mind. His attempt to deny his failure, the utter totality of his clan's collapse, his part in all of it as first son. As ruthless as he is, he is still samurai, Spider nods. He nods back and solemnly jacks in. As the soul colour rushes upon him, he speaks through the interface. The ocean waves swell. Stare into death's eyes laughing. The seagulls cry above. One might assume this means Kay will not be around during Cyberpunk 2077. Two possibilities are worth considering. It is currently unknown what happened to Kay's engram. He is trapped in a prison rather like Alt Cunningham, so technically he is still alive. The second and less likely option to consider was that under Kay's instruction, Arasaka were performing research into various technologies, including human cloning. Conceived when he was 80, 21-year-old Hanako Arasaka is Sabro's youngest child and the apple of his eye. Hanako was born to Sabro's third and last wife, Michigo, who died shortly thereafter due to complications caused by birth. Sabro was charmed by his little daughter's stunning beauty and he decided to raise her in the sheltered confines of a compound to protect her from the scarring traumas of life in the exterior world. Hanako received her schooling at the compound through trusted tutors. Cut off from the outside world, she learned how to travel and explore the net instead. Sabro made sure that Hanako was never made aware of the darker side of the corporation, but through her net explorations, Hanako is just beginning to suspect the horrible truth. Hanako is a sweet, intelligent woman, she has been chaffing under her father's well-meaning restraint for several years, but she has not voiced her complaints. She knows that her father wants to arrange her marriage in order to solidify a corporate alliance, but she secretly dreads the day it happens. Hanako did not want to hurt her father, but she has sworn to live an independent life after he dies. Hanako's relationship with Kei was strained. Shortly after 21-year-old Yoronobu Arasaka graduated from Tadai, his father, Sabra Arasaka, brought him to his private chambers at Arasaka HQ. There, he explained to his younger son the true nature of the Arasaka Corporation. 
rather than agreeing with his father's vision, Yorinobu was secretly appalled. That night, Yorinobu slipped out of the compound and vanished into the Tokyo night. Four years later, Yorinobu, considered to be a non-musical rocker boy, had gathered a cadre of tough Tokyo nomads, the Kotetsu no Ryu, aka the Steel Dragons. Together they swore to expose and destroy Arasaka. His knowledge of Arasaka facilities and corporate procedures gave the Kotetsu no Ryu some advantages, but they lacked the power or information to make serious headway against the corporation. Yorinobu is, however, able to tread the world of the street and the corporate tower with equal facility. When he's not riding with his men, he's travelling the world, meeting with other enemies of Arasaka, looking for funds and equipment. Then the Fourth Corporate War happened. Aside from providing the Japanese government details on Arasaka's operations, information on Yorinobu's exploits during the war remained elusive, until Johnny Silverhand and his team, while attempting to find the storage room for the Soul Killer program in Alt Cunningham, stumbled upon a data file titled Arasaka Yorinobu, 24th of the 9th, 2022. K. Arasaka had used the Soul Killer on his younger brother. Next to the Soul Killer database, Silverhand's team would find what appeared to be a cloning facility. What were Arasaka's scientists up to? Amongst the tissues samples, one was labelled Alt, 17 for the 2nd, 2013, and Yorinobu Arasaka, 23rd of the 9th, 2022. Remember that while not perfected in 2020, the ability to fully clone a human was viable at this time. Also, the Arasaka Tower riots, where Silverhand had originally attempted to rescue Alt, happened on April 13th, 2013, meaning Arasaka had somehow acquired Alt's DNA years earlier. It was revealed in Cyberpunk Red that Arasaka broke into three warring factions. The Bakufu faction, headed by Hanako Arasaka. The Princess faction, headed by Michiko Arasaka, Kei's youngest daughter, who, as a US citizen, allies with the new US government and the Rebel faction, headed by Kei's rebel son, Yorinobu. One can therefore speculate that the Yorinobu, who is currently fighting the other Arasaka factions, is either a cloned imposter, or there is a method of reversing the soul color process to integrate an engram into a cloned body. This raises many interesting questions about the 2077 narrative. Is it the real Yorinobu Arasaka? If the answer is yes, who restored his engram to a living body? What about the other victims of Soul Killer? If Yorinobu received a new cloned body, what about the tissue samples of Alt Cunningham and potentially Johnny Silverhand? Who has those tissue samples? Given that it was a Militech operation, are Militech secretly trying to take over the Arasaka Corporation through this new Yorinobu? What was the true purpose behind the Arasaka Research Facility? So many questions remain unanswered. Rash Botmas has broken into the toughest systems on Earth and committed multiple acts of corporate espionage with relative ease. He took on Netwatch and never lost, explored the farthest regions of cyberspace and claimed to be aware of the existence of aliens. Unlike other Netrunners who use a pseudonym such as Spider Murphy, Rash Botmas uses his real name to give his corporate enemies and Netwatch the proverbial middle finger. They know exactly who Rash Botmas is, but could never do anything about it. In the early stages of his career, Botmos worked legitimately with some software companies under the proviso he would not hack their systems, which usually lasted less than a couple of weeks. Once Botmos worked for CCI Development, with his assistance the company started developing many innovative software products. Unfortunately, Botmas dropped a few surprises into the database code, including several scandalous sex tapes. While the company fired him, Botmas simply used a kill switch on all their systems as a D 
departing gift. Bart Moss's last escapade was only two semantic degrees short of fatal, nailed by a particularly nasty type of black ice that placed his heart into continual fibrillation, he barely managed to activate his cryogenic celestial parachute backup system in time. The result froze his body but left his hyperactive mind still aware and jacked into the net. Botmos was too paranoid to tell anyone to retrieve his body, should he be killed. Thus, he became a frost-covered chunk of frozen meat, deteriorating in a cryogenic freezer, disguised to look like a refrigerator, while still managing to be the best hacker in the world. During the Fourth Corporate War, Militech asked Rash Botmos for his assistance against Arasaka. He was adamant against working for a corporation no matter how tenuous the connection, but Alt Cunningham convinced him to join her in the hunting for the Soul Killer 2.5 program. During Dark Errand, Arasaka agents finally tracked down the apartment Botmos resides in. Botmos worked on his apartment project for more than 10 years, with it being in full operation for at least three years. Everyone who lived in the apartment were corporate workers. Almost all of them were programmers, but every single one of them has a neural processor. This was no coincidence. Rash arranged by various ways to get everyone who didn't have a neural implant to leave the building. This he accomplished through a combination of credit destruction, police file tampering, posting rewards in bounty hunter magazines, and even getting other businesses to offer incompetent people outrageous employment opportunities. At the same time, he located suitable people for his project. A suitable person was a corporate worker, essentially someone competent, but not particularly bright, who had a neural processor and was socially inept. One by one, Rash took these people and infiltrated them with a customized anti-personnel program of his own design. While it didn't erase or replace their entire personality, it overlaid a part of their subconscious with his own directives. These directives included being a model citizen, a hard worker, socially private if not reclusive, and chipping in to the net every night. These victims all moved into the apartments which had been vacated. Soon everyone in the apartment building was a person with a hidden subconscious personality program. Now. Everyone in the building knew each other on sight. Strangers are immediately recognized as such. To prevent infiltration, each of the drones communicates with each other through a complicated Enigma code version of small talk, so outsiders would suspect nothing. Now, one might assume that when an outsider is detected, the rash would have his drones go into full combat mode. He was far smarter than that. Visitors can go through their lives largely unmolested. For all intents and purposes, the residents are nice, congenial, helpful people who aggressively yet passively resist anyone intruding into their apartment block. Rash did not want to attract attention with indiscriminate homicide. Instead, the drones offer their assistance, and if none is needed, they radio him. He then used subsonics to activate the intruder code into the residents in the building. The result is that while individual people come and go, there is always someone with any line of sight of the intruder to observe them. During the dark errand, where fighting started in earnest with Arasaka agents, every Everybody in the apartment building abandons all pretense and starts fighting viciously. In addition to the residents, Rash had a secret army of robots hiding in the apartment, such as tarantula, centipede and beetle robots, and bumblebee helicopter remotes. The final boss of Dark Errand was the legendary Deathwish. That is, Deathwish, the Cyber Kitty. Solid black outfitted with titanium rippers in its mouth and paws. Deathwish, the Cyber Kitty, protects the refrigerator that the frozen body of Botmos rests in. Botmos upgraded the Cyber Kitty's programming to produce a deadly mixture of feline instinct in Jackie Chan martial arts techniques. Following the demise of the Cyber Kitty, Arasaka agents riddle the frozen body of Botmos with bullets. Suddenly, a set of red flags whip up next to the fridge and start waving mechanically. An old-fashioned bell by the door starts ringing loudly. Red light flashes, of a printer next to the bell. The printer spits out three pieces of paper, strains of Beethoven's OD to Joy start booming from his stereos throughout the Conapt. Conapt is a cyberpunk phrase coined by Philip K. Dick, referring to a condominium and apartment. All the firing suddenly stops as confetti explodes from the ventilation ducts, and a small arachnoid robot drops from the ceiling, clutching a high-density data chip in its limbs. It says, Have a cookie. You have 30 seconds before the grand finale. During the escape, an agent grabbed three papers from the printer. First one reads, 
Congratulations! I am now apotheosized. Expect changes under the new management. The second, printed in Japanese, says, Learn to read English already. Arasaka today. The third says, Receipt. One rash botmos. Take your damn reward. But beware the fiscal chew worms before they eat your brain with sharp prognathous jaws, leaving nothing but flagellating orgiastic glee pods decomposing where your soul used to wrestle, screaming against the chains which bound you to your pathetic Weltanschauung. Yes, of course, that's a German word. I love Nietzsche, so go smoke your kimono. The data chip was a database detailing every aspect of the OTEC Sino war and how Eurobank was directly responsible for it all. For those unfamiliar with the Fourth Corporate War, while Arasaka vs. Militec took centre stage, it initially began with OTEC and Sino. Despite these revelations, at the end of 2020, nothing happened to Eurobank. In taking down Eurobank, the resulting scandal could have triggered another financial collapse, but this time in Europe. Aliens in Night City. This sounds like a preposterous news headline concocted after a drug-fueled hedonistic clickbaiting street rat orgy. But what if there was some truth behind these stories? Rash has on several occasions inferred that not only aliens exist, but that they have infiltrated the net. In other words, Chumba, you're dealing with an alien artificial intelligence. Before the events of the Fourth Corporate War, Rash disclosed that Lima and Santiago were the place where the space aliens did their first reconnaissance of the planet, landing on giant runways carved into the Andes. He does not believe these are the same aliens that have infiltrated the net, first because they weren't careful and left runaways the size of McCartney Stadium scratched into the rock, and second, they seem to prefer flying around in teacups to being in net space. These were the aliens who kidnapped Elvis. Rash explained that he honestly does not know why we spend so much on space exploration. We should spend our time and money investigating the aliens right here on Earth, sending out probes while aliens are getting themselves elected to positions of power is like setting up an electric fence when rats are already fornicating in your bedroom. Rash claimed that aliens in the net use the Orbitsville in space. Rash believed that aliens have taken over Orbitsville and they have control of all the major communication satellites, space stations, and their cutting-edge technology. They could use these satellite systems to secretly insert lies and misinformation into all YouTube videos until everyone believed what the aliens wanted, flashed subliminal messages in all ads, games, and net running programs. Rash apparently built a subliminal filter in order to remove this threat, which allowed him to recompile all the images. It worked. Rash believes he saw the aliens, but they quickly managed to find a way to bypass his filter. Rash theorizes that these aliens could be operating like street rats in Night City, creating fictitious media, doing reports on fictitious news stories about a fictitious corporation or government secret agency. A lot of viewers on YouTube would swallow it, mostly because like mindless automatons, they're now bred to swallow things without thinking about it. Then, when a government or some corporation issued a denial to any of these far-fetched stories, no one would believe them, and a new conspiracy theory would be born, giving birth to cancellation culture and hit pieces. Soon, the aliens would have us fighting each other, governments against corporations against the mindless public, fueled by clickbait, misinformation, and fake news. As far as Rash believes, aliens already have full control of Night City. There is only one hope for Night City, if the kids stop watching clickbait and attempt to develop sentience and critical thinking again. Surely there must be a voice of reason in all this madness. Well, Spider Murphy's take on aliens was, don't trust rash on this one. He's pretty close to being an alien himself and isn't the best choice to identify ETs. Spider does agree with Rash though, that if you want to encounter aliens in the net, then logically Orbitsville would be the place to be. Another candidate would be the Hawking Orbital Radio Telescope, which is always aiming itself at distant radio sources, and who knows what may have been downloaded into the NASA computers. Furthermore, creators of the net, Ihara and Grub, theorized that an alien intelligence with a lot of power and knowledge of Earth computer tech could link to the net over interstellar distances. Probably 
it could not actually do anything. The best solution would be to beam a link to an orbital satellite, downloading a copy of the alien AI into the net at this end, then move freely about the net. Johnny Silverhand, former lead singer of Samurai and his girlfriend Alt Cunningham, will be integral to the plot of Cyberpunk 2077. Silverhand was known in Night City as a famous and idealistic singer with his signature silver chrome cyber arm. His weapon of choice was the Melorian Arms 3516. Silverhand's discography includes notable hits such as Chippin' In and Never Fade Away from his Cool Metal Fire album. It's been suggested that Johnny Silverhand Silverhand was possibly born as Robert John Linder, sometime in the 1980s, the son of an Apple computer programmer and studio guitarist working the San Francisco club scene. Linder's family is rumoured to have been killed during the collapse. Records appear to indicate Robert joined the US Army, training as a soldier in the Special Operations Branch. Silverhand would reveal in his Sins of Your Brother album that he was a former US Marine who had deserted during the Second Nicaraguan conflict. This album triggered a wave of sentiment that resulted in the National Amnesty Program for a World Central American Conflict Veterans. As Silverhand himself remarked, if you can face the truth, you can face anything. So I faced the truth. Following an unsuccessful assassination attempt by Biotechnica, Silverhand would release his Clone Wars album that dealt with the idea of bioengineered humans being created as slaves for military and industrial purposes. Shortly afterwards, his girlfriend, Alt, would be kidnapped by Arasaka. Alt was a super wizard class netrunner and the inventor of Soul Killer. Soul Killer uses an advanced matrix recorder to copy the entire personality of an intruder, storing it in a huge database. It then wipes the original personality away, leaving a mindless husk that eventually dies. Arasaka wanted to acquire Soul Killer and so forced Alt to develop a version for them. On April 13th, 2013, Silverhand, unable to penetrate the security of Arasaka Towers by himself created a diversion by announcing a samurai concert just outside the buildings. 6,000 ardent fans turned up to the party. As the Arasaka guards began to lose their nerve, one of them accidentally fired into the crowd. Furious pandemonium ensued as the fans retaliated. As the fighting begins, the soul kill is used on alt. She floats naked in a sea of stars. Around her swirls the matrix of Soul Killer, towering into measureless space. Alt reaches out with her enhanced mentality, shaping and forming. A brief flare of thought, and Soul Killer sucks away the minds of her free guardian techs, letting their bodies drop. From the mind of the head techie, she pulls out the access codes to the mainframe's inner levels. She strips the memory of data, downloading it into her hidden files throughout the net. Twenty million dollars vanishes from accounting to reappear in a sub-account under her name. Pulling Toshiro's signature from his checking account file, she signs his name with a flourish. Using the access codes, she activates the room monitor. She can see the three techs slumped senseless in their chairs, her own unconscious body limply sprawled across the central console. Akira moves towards it, and Alt triggers the room lasers and cuts him in two. His body hits the floor with a steaming thud. Toshiro's eyes widen in shock, then narrow as he realizes what has happened. Congratulations, Miss Cunningham, he says with a mock formality. It seems you have found a way to escape your demise. You move and your laser meets you, retorts. She tracks the defense system onto him, locking it to fire at the slightest position change. Then she turns back into the soul killer construct, wrapping its power around her, gathering herself to transfer back into her body. The room staggers, lurches, as five pounds of plastic explosive slams through the ceiling of the elevator, creating an instant fireball. The lasers go wild, spilling a maze of ruby light in every direction. Toshiro throws himself flat, toppling the cyberdeck and breaking Alt's connections. She flails widely with the construct too little, too late. Three figures burst into the room, smart guns laying down a pattern of fire through the maelstrom. Johnny spots Alt still form, slumped over a contour couch. He takes her in his arms, trembling. Across the room, Rogue looks away. 
Well, 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 says Thompson, striding across the erect room towards the corporate head. What do we have here? Looks like kidnapping and maybe murder. They're going to put you away for a long, long time, Toshiro-chan. His green cyber-optic winks bright as he transmits live and direct to his news net. His head swivels right to left with practiced ease as he sub-vocalizes the opening to his story. The story he will use to break. Arasaka in Night City. Johnny stares a long time at Alt's almost lifeless body. There is a feeble pulse, but Alt is gone. Lost in the machine, trapped behind Crystal. Lost forever. Gone. He stands away from the couch. Cut transmission, he says to Thompson. The green cyber optic goes dark. Silverhand's own eyes are featureless white marbles. The hand convulses in fury by his side, locking onto the H and K in its low slung hip rig. The metal fingers lock to the butt, scrabble clicking along the pockerized grip. He just doesn't care anymore. He's dead inside. To hell with it. Silverhand raises the big black gun. A red pinpoint centers on Toshiro's forehead. Bang, says Johnny. The hand convulses. Bang, says the gun. Silverhand turns to gather up her still warm body in his arms. Behind the wall of monitors, a disembodied alt screams to him. But he can't hear her as he walks away. Shortly afterwards, Johnny Silverhand would go into hiding amongst the nomad groups for almost two years with his friend Santiago. During the Fourth Corporate War, August 20th, 2023, Silverhand would return to fight Arasaka once more. Militech gathered together a dream team consisting of the best operatives Night City had to offer, including Johnny Silverhand and Morgan Blackhand. Their mission to take out Arasaka's arcology with a nuclear demolition charge. Silverhand would lead Team Alpha, consisting of Rogue, Shiatan Thompson and Spider Murphy. During the mission, the team found out that Alt Cunningham was captured by Arasaka and was being held as a digital ghost, aka Engram, inside the Arasaka mainframe. Going somewhere? Adam's voice cuts through the silent offices like a bullet crack. Someone screams cover as machine gun and shotgun fire from Arasaka troopers spray through the narrow hallway cutting three of the team spec op troops in half. Spider scrambles behind a heavy pillar as Rogue and Johnny take a position behind office furniture wholly inadequate to the job of stopping heavy fire. Spider watches Shaitan simply fade into near invisibility against a wall. Rogue pops off a burst from her rifle then fires two grenades. Arasaka seem to want the lab intact and are not using heavy weapons. Team Alpha was under no such constraint. Shaitan fires off blast after blast from a portable cannon he calls a shotgun, but is tagged by an auto gun burst that sends him rolling. People on both sides spasm and fall as high velocity death fills the entire floor of the building. Somewhere, Spider hears Thompson scream in pain. Things are bad. There are too damn many of them. Plus that Borg, time to decide. Bullets chip at her cover while she hurriedly links her cyber deck into the heavy suitcase memory stash, carrying alt. No time to double check, no time to confirm links or space available. She launches herself into the net, dragging the linked icons that represent alt's personality, memories, and whatever else it is that makes her different from an expert system. All alt, she thinks to herself, is a hope and a prayer. Here goes nothing. With a virtual toss, Spider fires the various portions of alt out into the net, tagging them with a marker so that she can maybe retrieve them someday, and if she gets lucky enough, re res them back into her second best, now first best friend. On the other side of the room, Johnny crouches under a desk, fighting with his past between bursts of gunfire. I left Alt last time, just abandoned her. Not again, not ever. Better to burn out, says the hand. Yeah, he says to himself, and he knows what he must do. Spider spends just a few seconds in the net and eternity and never enough time. She comes back to find her cover still getting powdered, although the cacophony has diminished. She sees Rogue discarding her empty rifle and pulling two heavy pistols. Spider draws her own flechette pistol, its heavy weight somehow comforting in her hand. Suddenly, Johnny's voice rings out, not in song, but in challenge. Hey, Steelhead, let's rock and roll. Johnny is standing in plain sight, a Militech SMG in one hand, the Malorian in the other. He begins pumping rounds into Adam. Adam turns, but hesitates, astonished at the audacity of a rocker, challenging him with weapons that won't even dent his armor. An arm comes up. The auto shotgun in it opens fire. APDS rounds cut the young rocker in half. Johnny spins and falls to the ground. A surprised look on his face. The Malorian still smoking in his fist. 
It only takes a second. But a second is all Shaitan needs. He suddenly seems to emerge from the wall behind Adam and grapples with him. Seeing an opening, Rogue and Spider react as one. Rogue stands, bullets streaming from her pistols like tears, raking down Arasaka troopers. Spider sits up and fires, picking off targets and putting them down, one shot after another. It's all just a V-sim, she says. Just a game. Adam lurches around, but Shaitan's grip is that of desperation. Spider sees the Shaitan's right arm hangs shattered and limp at his side, blasted by a grenade. It's only a matter of seconds before Adam gets free and takes them all down. Get out of here! I've got him! Shaitan's hollow voice bellows of the two women. The rest of the arrows are down, but so are the spec ops. Rogue, Spider and the crippled Thompson are alone with two battling Borgs. They can hear more soldiers coming. They know they have no choice. As Spider moves to the rocker's mangled form, Rogue grabs her arm, her hard eyes boring into Spider's own. Johnny's dead, Spider. Help me get Thompson out of here. Rogue's eyes speak of a certainty and incredible pain, all slammed away behind an iron will to survive. Keep the meat baggage light, Rash used to say. Spider reaches for the data suitcase but sees that it, too, has been savaged by gunfire. It's wrecked. She quietly wishes Alt good luck. But Johnny will be avenged. Spider thinks to herself as she and Rogue drag the wounded Thompson to the elevator. Moments later, the nuke would detonate destroying Arasaka Towers. Silverhand's body was never recovered. More than 10 years later, rumours began to circulate that his body had been found in cold storage in a body bank in the wreckage of Old Night City. These rumours were never substantiated. By 2025, it became known that Alt Cunningham had survived in the net, as she established the ghost world, aka Shangri-La, in the ruins of bio-destroyed Hong Kong. Somehow, in 2077, an engram of Johnny Silverhand is currently coexisting with V as a result of a highly experimental biochip V has installed. Silverhand wants V to find Alt Cunningham, for what purpose currently remains elusive. Spider Murphy was part of Militech Team Omega alongside Johnny Silverhand, Rogue, Thompson and Shiton, who helped Morgan Blackhand take down the Arasaka Tower at the end of the Fourth Corporate War. Shortly afterwards, she gained the distinction of tracking down K. Arasaka after the tower was destroyed. K. Arasaka attempted to escape from Night City in a Sea Viper, only to find all his bodyguards unconscious and a young, beautiful woman sitting Caesar, dressed in a kimono, waiting to speak with him. Spider informs Kay that he must use the soul killer on himself, stating that it is the only honourable thing for him to do. Spider tells Kay, think of it as seppuku. After all, you are a samurai, are you not? After Kay uses the soul killer on himself, Spider finishes the fourth corporate war narrative with the words, Sleep well, Johnny, Morgan and Rash. Spider Murphy is very intelligent and quick-witted. She has nurtured and developed an artificial personality known as Robin Phillips for use in case she ever did get caught. This personality is bolstered by seeds of information she has sown in the net over the years. So to all appearances, Robin Phillips really exists. Spider is lightweight and bookish looking, very much a netrona instead of a physical person. Nevertheless, her voice synthesizer, motion detector and pain editor make her an effective part of an escape team. Spider's most telling features her long red hair, which she habitually wears as a single thick braid. It is rumoured that her real name is Arabella, but she has never used that name since she ran away from home at age 14, as it is common for netrunners to adopt a pseudonym. Kerry Uridine. In 2006, after signing with Universal Music, Samurai would achieve their first number one hit on the Euro radio charts with their single, Blistering Love. Six albums later, Samurai would eventually break up in 2008, becoming widely acknowledged as one of the most influential bands of all time. Ever since rockers Kerry and Johnny Silverhand parted ways, Kerry has been a successful solo artist. He's withstood the test of time. His albums have gone platinum. 
His broken guitars have been auctioned for thousands of Euro dollars, and his singing voice is recognized worldwide. Eurodyne was eager to shout his own message. He'd done his time touring with Silverhand, and he had a deep concern for the destructive culture that dominated the world. The road trips were sobering. Fans murdered each other just to get tickets. Everyone carried a gun, and the scenery from the tour bus was either a polluted corporate structure or a colourless Mother Earth drained of her resources. Filled with determination, Kerry started writing songs again. He had a favourite phrase, time for change. The first there was his off-centre album, Modern Trenches, chronicling the tragedies and heroes of the second conflict. Then came Critical Mass, the tribute to the victims of the annihilation of Colorado Springs in 2008, followed by Made in America, a dedication album to the families who suffered in the Chicago bio-plague of 2012. In each of them, Kerry chanted behind synthesized choruses, Time for change. But it was the age of survival, and most people were only interested in drugs, fast rides, and slow death to enemies. Firefights were an everyday occurrence. Though people loved Kerry Urodyne's sound, they didn't seem to grasp the meaning of his lyrics. Like an angry father scolding someone else's child, Kerry sang the world's injustices to tone deaf ears. In an interview with Landon Smythe, Kerry Urodyne commented upon his relationship with Silverhand. I don't think Johnny's success had anything to do with my making it big. I think we are both talented individuals who were lucky enough to get the big break when the time was right. I wouldn't care less if Johnny were to get top billing on every show. The whole idea that I'm jealous of Johnny's career is just something the scream sheets have played up because it sells. If anything, I think Johnny may be more disgusted with the stardom than I am. It really isn't easy to be under public scrutiny 24 hours a day. When asked about the future of his professional relationship with Johnny Silverhand and the rest of the music industry, Kerry was realistic about his goals. I don't know what's going to happen in the business. No one ever does. I can think of many bands who've hit it big for free albums and then disappeared without a trace. Others will last for just one album, or maybe six. You can never tell how the public will react to what you play. Who knows, in a year I may be back to playing clubs. I don't think it will happen, but you can never tell. As for Johnny, I intend to keep touring with him if it suits us both. Besides a few guest appearances on albums, I doubt we'll ever really play together again. We've both changed musically, and I think our egos would cause enough stress in a band to destroy any working relationship that we might have. And that brings us to the end of the ultimate lore preview. If you made it this far, then congratulations are in order. You might just have what it takes to become the best in Night City. Thank you for chipping in. What's the best?